uh, John is doing that. So, you know, <clears throat> I'm very excited to uh, uh, talk about uh, Reese Howells. Uh, only because of the impact that he has had tremendously on my life. So very excited to talk about this missionary today. Yeah, I shouldn't call him just a missionary. He had a very short missionary calling to Africa. Uh, so we'll look at that. And actually it was a time during there was a epidemic in Africa of flu. So we'll talk about that. But, you know, this person has tremendously influenced um, you know, um, how to pray and how to intercede. And as we were singing all these songs, right, uh, he has lived a life to show how, even if you're not a missionary, where you are, how prayer is so powerful, how prayer with the burden that the Holy Spirit gives you and leads you. And if you're obedient um, and if you listen and tune your heart to what God is asking you to do, um, you know, you can you can change the course of history. You can change the course of your nation. So, you know, I, um, I, I hope I do justice in telling about his life. So Rhys Howells, um, he was born in Wales in 1879, and he lived a wonderful life until 1950. And we'll see, and, um, you know, I cannot share all of what he did, but we'll just look at the very high level, um, you know, of, of, his, uh, of his accomplishments, right? So Rhys Howell was born in Wales, Brennan Man, that's the small little town in, in southern Welsh that he was born. He grew up in a family of 11. Um, and, you know, very pious parents, very pious grandparents, very pious uncles and aunts, they took to church, um, you know, they, it, it was a very good upbringing in biblical knowledge. Um, and, um, you know, Reese was very different from the rest of the children. He had a very tender conscience, you know, there's just one incident, his father used to be a shoe, um, you know, a shoekeeper, uh, you know, he had a shop that sold shoes. So he was asked to one day go deliver a shoe to, um, to somebody and it was nine pence. So, you know, the, while he was going to deliver the shoe, he thought, what if I said it is 10 pence, right? Oh, how the guy doesn't know. So he said it is 10 pence and, you know, the, the person who bought it paid him 10 pence. So he took nine back to his father and he bought apples with the, you know, with the, with, with the, with the one pence that he has falsely earned. He ate the apple, but the guilt, he could not overcome the guilt. So he knew that he had to confess to his father. Um, so, you know, he confessed to his father, but even after he confessed it, he always reminded every time he saw an apple, he remembered uh, how it is so wrong uh, at a very young age. He was not even nine or 10 years of old of age. At a very young age, you know, he realized that that was wrong, that the, that the Holy Spirit in him, he did not know it was the Holy Spirit, but he felt that was something wrong to do. And, you know, they, they credit him for such a soft, tender heart that listens, that listens to the voice that speaks within him. Um, so he, he grew up to be a young man. And at that time in 1880s and 1890s, what was happening? Who was coming where from Europe? Right. They were, I mean, I, I know if we were in person, all the kids would have said what was going on. But at that time, people were migrating from Europe to America. Right. So America was the new dream. America was <clears throat> where life was happening. Uh, so he at a very young age right as a teenager he decided to go with his cousin because he was so ambitious right so reese howell grew up with the, you know he, he was very smart he was very good he had a tender heart but he had this ambition that in a short time i want to earn a lot of money and i want to come back and in the town that he lived they used to do a lot of mining tin mining and coal mining because we're all very popular at that time in your in uh, europe and and uk and and uh, england right and wales so he decided to go learn and then come back and, and uh, you know, have a very good life where he earns a lot of money. And he did. And he says he used to love money. So he wanted to earn a lot of money. So he set sail for India along, uh, sorry, set sail for uh, America along with his cousin. And he reached and they, and they, and they started working in a tin mine. And these, this cousin and him, they used to hang out a lot. Now I tell you, right, he, he grew up in a Christian home. Um, he, he was a very you know, soft hearted person. But one day his cousin asked him, right, one question. He said, Hey, Reese, right, have you been born again? Right. So Reese said, Okay, what does it mean to be born again? Right. I, I don't understand. I, I live a good life. I, I don't tell a lie. I, I go to church. I sing songs. I worship. But 
you know, his, his friend was telling, his cousin was telling him, but that's not what it is about. It is this experience of being changed from within. So they got into so many arguments that in the end, Ree said, you know, my, my cousin doesn't even respect me. Uh, so I'm just going to move away from him because they, it became, the relationship became so bitter. So he moved to a different part of the United States. He actually moved somewhere close to Pennsylvania. Now, at that time, there was an outbreak of typhoid, right? And at that time, uh, um, I I don't know if they were back. I think it was very late that they found the vaccination for typhoid. But nonetheless, there, there was a typhoid outbreak and Reese fell sick. He fell sick to the point that he was at his deathbed. And at that time, the question that his cousin asked, right? Do you really know where you're going to go? Because if you're not born again, he said, you cannot go to heaven. So the thought that he perhaps will not go to heaven and that he would be condemned to hell in eternity bothered him so much that he said, Lord, if I survive this disease, if I survive uh, you know, and recover from typhoid, then I am going to seek you out. I'm going to find out who you are. And I, I know that I'm not right with you, right? So God did hear his prayer and he did heal him completely. He did not die. He was recovered and um, restarted a journey of about five months searching and searching and searching for what is this being born again. So he went back to his cousin. His cousin couldn't explain to him what it was and he couldn't get it. He was at the verge of saying, Lord, I, I don't know. You have to tell me who you are. And at that time in Pennsylvania, he met he, he decided to go to the meeting of a young Jewish convert named uh, Morris Rubin, right? He was conducting meetings. He was talking in a, in a, in a, in a, in a church. And Reese happened to know about this. And he said, okay, I got to go listen what this guy has to say. So here he went to the church uh, and he heard this Morris Rubin talking about the cross, how Jesus was bled and how Jesus died on the cross for us. And Reuben, uh, sorry, Reese cried like a baby, right? He cried and cried and he could not stop himself. And he realized the love that God had for him. And that was his moment of salvation. He said, Lord, I want to know you. Forgive me for all my sins. And he had that experience of being born again, right? Where what is being born again there? When you accept your sins and you ask God for forgiveness and you ask for Jesus' blood to wash you and cleanse you and, and you know, you reestablish that connection with God, right? That is being born again. Uh, you know, you establish that connection with it, being able to talk to God. So he was like a new man. So God, you know, um, the, the, he was just elated and he was a changed man. So right about that time, uh, what did I tell, tell in the beginning? Of course, I, you can't respond back to me. But in the beginning, I told you, right, he was a man of ambition. He knew what he wanted. Uh, but as soon as he was born again, he said, I don't think I want the money anymore. I don't think that's my ambition anymore. I don't want to be in the United States anymore. So he decided to go back to Wales. And it was in the year um, 1904. Okay, and 1904, uh, he actually got a very good promotion in the company that he was working at, and it, his pay was going to be doubled. And you know, he felt the Holy Spirit telling him, "This is not the path for you, right? I have a different plan for you." So he decided to go back to uh, to Wales, to his own country. And right about that time, in 1904, when he returned, there was a great revival going on in. Wales, right? It is actually known now as the Welsh Revival, where in a matter of a year, a preacher called, um, oh, I cut out his name. Uh, I forgot his name. The guy on the on the left, I think. Uh, Evan Roberts, huh? Yeah, Evan, Evan Roberts, right? So at that time, this preacher, he was causing such a stir within the churches of Wales that people were crying and repenting. And it was not just that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It was almost like the day of Pentecost. That's how beautiful it was. And every church goer became a witness of what Jesus had done in their life. So in it, it is being told that in a matter of one year, it was almost like 150,000 people were added into the churches. Um, in, in, in Wales at that time. So Reese, 
at least happened to participate in one such meeting. And, you know, when he was taking the train to go to a meeting, he, you know, the Holy Spirit told him that, you know, Reese, when you come back, you're not going to be the same man. And he didn't understand because he thought that he already received the salvation. He had that beautiful ex experience of how, you know, God transformed his life. But when he went to the one of the revival meetings and it was a five day meeting and, you know, in five days, God spoke to him and the Holy Spirit pointed out to him that there are so many things within him that he has to let go if he really wants to be a vessel that, you know, God can use. So, you know, the sin, sin that was within him was canceled when he became, you know, in, in Pennsylvania, when he confessed his sins and he asked God to come into his heart, his sins were forgiven. But it wasn't sin that the Holy Spirit was talking about right now. It was his self, right? We all have self. There is something within us which is always at war, uh, you know, with what God wants us to do. So, you know, his message was, Reese, you got to learn how to give control of that self to me and then see what I'm going to do with you and see how you're going to become an intercessor. Now, I don't know if all of you, I mean, I'm talking to the kids, if all of you have, have heard of what who an intercessor is, right? We talk about prayer warriors who pray and, you know, who will go to battle and who will pray uh, very, very hard. But intercessor is a little different. Intercessor is somebody who whom God lays a burden, right? They, they don't get the burden themselves. God will say, um, Reese, I want you to pray for this person. So it's a God-given burden and they will not stop praying for that particular cause until it comes to pass. So that's the difference between a prayer warrior and an intercessor. Now, intercessor, you cannot just get a burden just like that, right? It is something that God gives the burden for you. So to become an intercessor, the Holy Spirit was telling him, you have to give up the biggest choice, the biggest gift that every human has. What is that? You know what that is? It is the free will, right? You all, we all have the choice of free will. When we give up that choice of free will to God, they'd say, Lord, it is not my will. It is not my choice, but it is your choice. Then God moves in and you get become, you know, like, John 15 says you become the wine and the branch and you become one with God and you will know exactly, you know, all throughout Reese's life, he talks about hearing from God. It, it, ha it needs a very sensitive heart that can discern when God is speaking and what he's asking you to pray for and whom he's asking you to pray for. So, so that's what it is. He would spend hours and hours praying, right? And he lived... <clears throat> He got a job um, in his community, right? It was a it was it was a small community. That's okay. It was a small community in uh, in in um, <clears throat> of tin tin mining uh, folks. So so Reese used to spend hours praying for many people. That when when he would be walking down to his his uh, his workplace, the Holy Spirit will lay a burden upon him, right? He would say, "I want you to pray for this person," and Reese would spend hours praying for his salvation. And God would show him exactly what to pray for and how to pray for it. Many people did not even know that Reese was praying for him. Many of them, you know, they say that they were ill in their deathbed of consumption. Consumption is like a disease like, uh, you know, like tuberculosis where there is no hope. Uh, it's a deteriorating uh, disease. So he has prayed for many back to life. But, you know, he, he would wait for the Lord's prompting, you know, the Holy Spirit's leading. Who should I be praying for? And, and then he... When, when the Holy Spirit said, okay, this is the person, then he would, he would spend hours seeking, Lord, how should I be praying for them? And sometimes he would be asked to give up things, right? Give up your food, give up, uh, you know, in that time, sometimes it's very silly. In, in, in the 1870s or 1900s, you always wore a top hat. You would never, if you are in a respectable family, uh, you would never step out without your top hat on. Um, at in, when he was interceding for somebody and when he had to learn to say no to himself and his pride, God once asked him to say, okay, I want you to now stop wearing your top hat for so many months right when you're praying and and it you know it sounds very silly to us now but in that days apparently it was very disgraceful for for a for a man to walk around in the city without his hat but he did it out of complete obedience and when he obeyed you know god gave he he uses the term god gave him a, a special position of you know he calls it gaining a position of intercession and he would knew exactly when god would answer his prayer so uh, you know, God, 
completely worked in his life and it was a special bond that he formed and I, I you know with God um, and he was very very specific um, in his, his his message from God's were so specific uh, he had an uncle for example he had an uncle who was an invalid all his life for 30 years of his life he spent in a wheelchair and one day God told him I'm gonna heal uncle um, Willie. Willie I'm gonna heal uncle Willie so he said, Lord, he has not walked for 30 years of his life. He said, yes, I'm going to heal him. You're going to pray. And he was his prayer partner, by the way. Uncle Willie was his prayer partner. So he went and told Uncle Willie, this is what Lord is telling me, that he's going to heal you. Uh, so Uncle Willie said, okay, is that so? I'm going to ask the Lord if that is true. So he went and prayed and he said, looks like God wants me to be healed. So the both of them started praying and God told them specifically the date and the time when his uncle will be healed it was a sunday and it he said at sunday morning at six and this is not something that just comes right this is hours of praying and being able to hear what god is able to tell and being right with god and he said uncle god is going to heal you on this sunday and at 6 a.m you will be healed and you will walk the two miles to the village church right now the you know that's great uh, everybody would wait till that all of that happens but you know the god told him why don't you proclaim it to the world that uncle willie is, billy uh, willie is going to walk to church and he said sure i will and he did and everybody thought that he had lost it right and especially on the saturday before the day the big grand day was supposed to happen uh, the saturday before uncle willie became so sick he became so gravely ill and all along doubts would rise. But you know, Reese, once he decided and he knew that this is what God has told, he would never back off. He would not have an ounce of unbelief. He said, Lord, you have told it, it will happen. And even on Saturday when he fell sick and the whole village was saying, you know, poor Uncle Willie, he has gone astray listening to his nephew. Um, you know, he continued to believe and sure enough, on Sunday at 6 a.m., Uncle Willie came out of the bed, did not need a wheelchair, and he walked the two miles to church, right? It sounds like the supernatural, but it is, right? How powerful prayer is and how prayer done with the Holy Spirit's guidance is such an effective tool, okay? So that was a small example. There are many examples of what he did. This was his life right after he returned from America and was part of the Welsh revival. So a um, few years after that, you know, he, he got married uh, to a very young, you know, he, he grew up with Elizabeth. Uh, she used to work with him in the missions. Uh, it was a perfect match. Uh, they married and they also started, you know, uh, Reese Howell is also known for his faith living, right? So in one of his times when his love for money was, he had a lot of money and he was in, from a well-to-do family and he had a lot of money to give away too. So uh, the Lord told him, you know, if you are going to give me your free will and everything else, right? If you truly tell me that, you know, I'm, you are completely my property, you know, I'm at your disposal. He's going, you know, God said, even your money is, you know, for me to choose how to be used. So from that day on, even his own money, he would not spend it until the Lord told him what to do with it. So, you know, they lived by a life of faith. So um, for their wedding expenses or many such things, they never had any money and they would, they would pray about it and God would deliver in such miraculous way right before, you know, the moment before, um, you know, the money was needed. So I can't give you a lot of details, but I'll just give you one detail, um, which is, you know, which ties into the story of, of how they got called into mission. So um, <clears throat> uh, before we go there, they did have a son, right? They did have a son, Samuel Howells. And when the baby was just an infant, um, you know, Samuel uh, uh, Reese got his calling. So what was his calling? There was a South African mission that said that they needed um, a mission, uh, they need a missionary in Africa. And God said that, you know, the heathens in Africa are so many, you know, will you, will you, are you ready to sacrifice giving up your son for me, you know, to go to Africa? Um, so, you know, it, it, it sounds, I mean, if I were, I'm a mom, right? To give up your child, an uh, infant child, 
to go do something that takes a lot of lot of um, lot of faith and a lot of heartache and still being obedient to god so not just for him but for his wife you know two people came step forward to to take care of reese's son infant son and uh, you know when both of them were praying reese and elizabeth were praying god told them just because you decided to sacrifice your son right sacrifice as in they can't take him along so they have to leave him back in wales right just because you are able to do that for me i will give you 10000 souls in africa that is what i'm going to do for you right so they were so thrilled and you know even though it was like a dagger that went through their heart to leave their child they decided to go because god had promised that they will see revival in africa so that's the portion of the story where he actually goes um as a missionary to africa and i'll tie in to how they do uh, you know how their faith living was right so to go to africa as a mission we we have seen in other missionaries too right they have to get trained it was a common thing to get them some kind of basic medical training so they know how to handle when they are in mission fields so for all of that money was needed and he was not supposed to ask anybody for his needs you know it was always god who was to provide and it was always provided miraculously but the best story was when they was going to africa right uh, they had to board the train from london uh, they had <clears throat> they had money put away but they also lived with a rule for themselves that if a need comes first the money is gone right even if you have put it aside for something else if there is a need comes then you have to give up that money so there was another need came and they had to give up the money they had about 16 uh, shillings or something in their hand so they got ready they went to the train station and uh, they said lord how are you going to work this all out many people came to say goodbye but none of them handed them any money so they said okay if it's 16 pence that we have we'll go we'll buy a ticket that takes us you know half way through i don't know the station's name so they they went there and uh, they bought the ticket and it took them to the next station right then they had to wait for 2 hours for the train to come for them to be able to go to to london to catch their uh, ship so as they waited there right uh, you know reese uh, reese was was having all these voices in his head right that you preach about a god who splits the red sea for you you know how are you going to go back to your own village and how are you going to go and tell them that you don't have the god did not provide the money but he had to calm all those voices and said my god will provide so the holy spirit asked him rees what would you do if you had the money right now right the rees said i would be standing at the ticket counter ready to buy a ticket so he said okay do that so he went with no money in his hand he went and stood at the ticket counter and right when there were two people right ahead of him out of a crowd a man came and just you know shoved money into his hand he said i cannot stay here any more in the line you know just take it and he just left right so that's how miraculously god provided for rees right so he bought the ticket they went to london they met their sponsor and they were they were missing three things for their journey to go to africa one was a raincoat um a watch for the husband and wife and uh, and fountain pen to write so these were the last three things that they just did not have so guess what happened when they went to meet their sponsor they he asked exactly the three things he said here's a gift from my son which was a a watch for him and his wife and he said do you have raincoats they said no okay uh here's the money to the sports store across go get yourself raincoats because you're going to need it and also uh do you have pens they said no so exactly the three things that they wanted god provided in such miraculous way right so that is the faith living who else you know who inspired him by the way for all of this faith living um it was john muller uh, sorry um george muller we have learned about george muller too right the guy who wrote diaries and diaries of the of prayers right the one with the orphanage who did not depend upon anybody so george muller he 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 learned it from george muller and uh, he had continued to live a life of faith anyway so they ended up reaching africa and in africa when they arrived in the mission station everybody was so excited so excited that people from the welsh revival right the where, where the spirit of god was poured out has come um you know to africa so god had promised reese what 10000 souls so he said lord 
you, you are going to have to outpour your spirit upon this nation because that is what you have promised, right? So we started talking in small congregations and soon this heard and saw how there was a mighty outpouring. People would just break down and cry and give their lives to God. And they would be such a, you know, such a presence of the Holy Spirit that, you know, soon they were on a journey for 15 months. They visited all the mission stations in South Africa and hundreds and thousands were confirmed, uh, were converted. So <clears throat> their, um, you know, the, their journey uh, took them nearly two years to finish seeing all the mission stations. They were in Africa for five years and he calls it the most productive five years of his life where it was just, you know, just loving the people of Africa, just pouring their love out to them and, and praying and, and mentoring others to be able to, you know, take out that, take it, you know, to teach the, how to pray and how to, uh, to receive God and salvation. So in one of the mission stations, when he was, uh, when he was stationed, uh, you know, there was an influenza outbreak in Africa, just like the Spanish flu here. It was in the year 1918, that there was a big influenza outbreak. Now, everybody around him was uh, were dying, but God had whispered and spoken to Reese Howell saying, nobody in the mission station is going to die. There were about 68 people already infected, but all the medical training that he and his wife had gotten, uh, you know, came in handy. And, you know, I can't go into the details, uh, but he, he prayed, he sat by those who were critically ill. He would pray with them. He would intercede for them. And he said, Lord, you said nobody would die. So nobody can die. And, you know, the news soon spread out, right? So he declared boldly saying that, you know, he, because he felt God heard it, he heard God say that nobody died, uh, will die to, to, to just activate what he felt, right? That he, he heard God speak. He made a declaration saying, nobody in the mission hospital is going to die. You know, soon what happened, all the chiefs of the neighboring villages heard this and they said, the white man is able to keep the people alive. And the hard hearted people, the ones who would not receive the gospel, just saw how the hand of God was in the mission, mission in, in, the, in the mission station. And both Reese and his wife, up, you know, totally devoted themselves to taking care of the sick and praying and interceding by the end of it all you know not even one person died in the in the base camp so that is the power of prayer when we pray for those who are affected with the coronavirus right there is power because we are believing um you know that we pray to a living god who is able to save and protect so um that was his call to africa but soon after that, he had to come, come back home. Uh, in 1920, he returned back home. And um, that's about the, 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 you know, the, the end of the story. But his life doesn't end here, right? Once he came back, God used him as a mighty instrument, right? To, to create and, and, and mentor many intercessors, right? People who would pray would pray without ceasing. He started the Bible College of Wales and it's a beautiful story how God brought him to that position of calling, uh, of being a, you know, starting a Bible college that based on the principle of, of, of living by faith and the gospel should go to every key creature that was his commission he he felt that the lord told him he had this vision that said gospel to every creature so every creature on this earth has to hear the gospel that means i need to pray more about it and i need to be able to train more people who are able to do that for others and not just that they would pray in this Bible college, um, you know, they would pray not just for themselves and their spiritual growth, for, but for many, many world events, right? Um, there was world, uh, the uh, World War II was going on at that time. So how the D-Day, uh, how the British army was saved, how the uh, uh, Salerno, the miracle at Sara, uh, Salerno, right? Where the Italian troops were, were surrounded by German armies. Nobody knows why they turned back and did not attack, but you know, it is beautiful to see how in the small Welsh Bible college, there was a group of people just praying because Reese felt that his soldiers are, you know, have no chance if, if we don't pray for them, if we don't support them, if we don't do the groundwork of praying for them, they will be just 
you know, annihilated by the Germans. So he took it so seriously. And even when Israel was being born and UN was asked to, um, you know, there was, UN had to uh, acknowledge that Israel was a nation. So uh, during the Holocaust, there are so many details of how they interceded so specifically and how the Holy Spirit led them on what to pray for and how to pray for that they saw tremendous victory in his life. So that was the story of Reese Howells. Um, actually for all the young adults and, and also, you know, uh, of course, adults too. There's a wonderful book called Reese Howells, The Intercessor. It's a book by Norman Grubb. Uh, all of this, there are about 37 chapters. They're available on YouTube. Uh, you're on summer vacation. So all the young adults out there can certainly hear this. It's just 30 minutes each chapter and somebody's reading it for you. So it's, it's, it goes through his childhood till his death day. And it's just, it, it is just um, a wonderful story of a man who lived by prayer, just interceding, just hearing how the Holy Spirit was leading him and prayed specifically, uh, giving up himself, abiding in what the Holy Spirit was leading him to. And he, you know, he truly changed the course of nations and of history. So um, such a great story. Um, I was truly inspired by it. And um, I hope that, you know, um, you guys get a chance to uh, hear him more in, in YouTube. So we can just close uh, with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our gracious loving Father, we, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord. Father, we are beyond inspired, O oh Master, Lord, of this wonderful man of yours. So, Father, Lord, how he gave up, Lord Father, himself to pray for others, Lord, to just pour out himself, O oh Master, Lord, just like we've been hearing and singing, Lord, to to have that burden for souls that are lost, to have the burden for nations that are going astray, to have a burden, Lord Father, for things that are chaotic around this world. Oh Father, we thank you and we praise you for that spirit of supplication and anointing of, of prayer that was upon this man. I pray that we will, Lord, we will model him, Lord, that he will, Lord, that we will be led in a similar manner to know, Lord, to, to die to self, to die to free will, and Lord, to be able to surrender completely to you. And as you lead us, O oh Master, and especially for our children, I pray, the next generation, Lord, that they will know that there is power in prayer, that there is power, O oh Father, to move, Lord Father, immovable mountains, O oh Father, and Lord, that they will, it will be a witness in their lives, O oh Father. We thank you for and praise you for such great men of history who have existed before us, who have paved the way for where we are, and Lord, we praise you and we thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for every generation. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen.